So greetings, everyone. Welcome to Tantra Talks and Authentic Yoga Podcast. I'm your host, James Gopala, and I'm very honored to be joined by Patrick McEwen. How are you doing, Patrick? Good, James. Thanks very much. It's good to be here. I think we're going to have a, an interesting conversation. Brilliant. Yeah, it's great that you could join us. Patrick is a world leader in functional breathing. And he's written nine books, the most recent book being Atomic Focus. And uh, probably the most famous book, Oxygen Advantage, which I have here, really talks about the scientific approach to functional breathing for optimal performance, sport performance. And really interested in your journey, Patrick, which led you to developing the Oxygen Advantage and starting with the Pateco method. Can you tell us a little bit about how you first got into breathing and, and how that has developed and evolved to, to what you're doing now? Sure. Um, like, with, like many kids with asthma, you don't just have asthma, but you, you would typically have a stuffy nose as well. And as a result, then you will, you're more likely to breathe through an open mouth as I did. And mouth breathing is faster breathing because there's less resistance to breathing by breathing through the mouth. And mouth breathing is also causing upper chest breathing. So I was that highly strong individual, but very poor sleep quality and very poor concentration and attention span. And I'm by no means unique. And I got through school and I left school at 14 years of age, never to go back. And just life took a twist and I did go back. And I was quite driven and I got into a university in Dublin called Trinity College. I graduated there in 1996, 1997, and my asthma was getting worse. And I came across a newspaper article and it spoke about the importance of breathing in and out through the nose, which I wasn't doing. And it spoke about the importance of breathing light, which I wasn't doing because you would always hear my breathing. Typically during rest, you know, you would notice that I was breathing I would have had regular sighing, for example. I often felt air hunger. And I took that article on board and it was just something that just caught me, you know, and like I've read many articles, but a piece of information like that, that just, it got me. And I started doing the nose unblocking exercise and I was able to decongest my nose. And that night I taped my mouth closed. And uh, I also used nasal dilators because my nose was not working well at all. First morning, I don't really remember a whole lot of, you know, better in terms of sleep. I kept nasal breathing all the second day and uh, feeling air hunger, bit of a challenge. I didn't have the exercise, of course, that I have now, but uh, I was fairly, you know, committed to, to giving, it a, giving it a shot. I'd sleep that I had in about 15 years. So for me, like... I was after finishing a four year degree in Trinity and you don't just change then to embark on breathing. So I was in the corporate world and for a couple of years, I have to say, I absolutely hated it. I hated the pressure that big corporations were putting on the employees. And that's how I felt there at that time, you know, and then I was putting this pressure on the, the people underneath me. So I think I did the, the wrong degree and breathing was my forte. And I was driving from one side of Ireland to the other, which is not very wide anyway. And uh, just, I got this kind of a, a feeling that I should be teaching breathing and that was it. I put in my notice that weekend and that's it. You know, I've been teaching full-time since 2002. So, so it was just a series of twists and uh, ended up teaching breathing and found something that, yeah, it fits, it fits, fits me, suits me. Fantastic. And for those who aren't familiar with the Bateco method, yeah. it is a, a, a medical approach to breathing, especially for people with asthma, where the focus is on a light breath, a, an inaudible breath. Could you tell us a little bit more about this particular technique? Yeah, like Dr. Buteco, he was a medical doctor in uh, Soviet Russia, and he noticed that his sick patients were breathing too hard and fast. Very simple observation. And you will see this with people who are unhealthy. You will see them coming into the yoga studio, people with high anxiety, people with respiratory issues, people with diabetes, people with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and a host of different conditions. Look at their breathing, and you will typically see that their breathing is fast and hard. And he asked a question. He said, was it the condition that was causing their breathing to be faster and harder? Or was it their faster and harder breathing which was feeding back into the condition? So he started teaching his patients 
to slow down their breathing and breathe less air to do in actual fact do the very opposite to what we commonly hear to breathe less air to increase carbon dioxide in the blood because carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas but it influences our blood circulation so it's very common for people with poor breathing patterns to have cold hands and cold feet and brain fog it's very common for them to yawn frequently to sigh frequently during the day and Breathing too much air causes more harm than eating too much food. And I was a person who was breathing too much air for many years. And I remember, James, reading a book back in 95 or whatever. I can't remember exactly, but I was doing an exam, a final year exam, a bit anxious going in, as you would be as half fast and upper chest breather. And I took a walk before going into the exam hall and I took these full big breaths. And I don't know, was it through my mouth or nose, but I did it in an effort to calm down. And I walked into the exam hall and I was completely spaced out and lightheaded. Entirely the wrong thing to do. And, you know, I think this is the thing about breathing. And Dr. Buteco, he made a very simple discovery. He started teaching his patients to breathe less air. And you could see that many of them, um, that they got benefits from it. Now, he centered his his theory based on carbon dioxide, we now know that probably the Buteco method is more likely to be helping to strengthen the baroreflex, which is a very important part of the autonomic nervous system, baroreceptors in the major blood vessels, and to bring the body into balance, sympatovagal balance, to increase heart rate variability and vagal tone. And I think that's really the crux of it. But carbon dioxide also plays a role. It's not just that gas that people, that waste gas. You know, how many times, you know, we hear bring in as much oxygen as you can and get rid of as much carbon dioxide as you can. Discovered back in 1904 is the Bohr effect. And it states that hemoglobin, which is a carrier of oxygen in the, in the blood, hemoglobin releases oxygen in the presence of carbon dioxide. So it's ironic that when we take full big breaths, we are depriving the body of oxygen and we are causing blood circulation throughout the body to constrict. So the goal is to, to not over-breathe, but to make the breath as subtle as possible. Yeah, it's, it's just like, it's not that we need to be going throughout the day um, under-breathing, but it's that we practice under-breathing for periods of time during the day. And that in turn then, causes our breathing to be lighter and slower. So for example, I'll give you this, you know, many people will focus on the respiratory rate and they'll say that the optimal respiratory rate for an adult may be between 10 and 14 breaths per minute with the upper limit of 16. You cannot slow down the respiratory rate by focusing on the respiratory rate. But if you breathe less air, and if you, in turn, you reduce the body's response to the ga gas carbon dioxide, because what causes us to take every breath is carbon dioxide, not oxygen. The body breathes to get rid of excess CO2, but some people will be overly sensitive to the increase of carbon dioxide in the blood. And as a result, then their breathing is harder and faster. So the faster respiratory rate of the individual can be due to the increased chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide. So we have the person breathes less air to create air hunger, breathing in and out through the nose, this in turn reduces the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, which in turn reduces the respiratory rate towards normal. Excellent. And in, in the yoga system, of course, we have pranayama. So prana being life force, which is very much uh, fed and charged through the breath, very much closely linked to the breath. And prana and ayama, ayama, Often it's understood as the control, the restriction of prana, but actually with the A, the negative, it's ayama, it's the expansion of prana through the, through the body. And so in, in the yoga tradition, we obviously have a, a full system dedicated to pranayama, which traditionally follows asana in the Eightfold Path. And in the yoga sutras, it's described as a method to actually balance the energy of the body to ultimately prepare us for those deeper stages of yoga, i.e. your meditation and your deep states of meditation into samadhi. And it's, um, I think, traditionally, originally, 
the, the yogis were true scientists. They really understood the importance of breath, the power of breath, the importance of kumbhaka, the retention of the breath, which again, if we look at the Hatha Yoga Parapika, which is the kind of foundational text of modern Hatha Yoga, it talks about how the mind and breath are intimately interlinked, actually describes it as milk and water, how the two are, are almost one and the same, and how if you control your breath, the mind will quieten. If you quieten the mind, the breath will quieten. And it goes a step further, saying that the breath and the mind are actually the causes of vasanas, which are deep-rooted karmic imprints, our desires, the things that keep us in this uh, cycle of birth and, and rebirth, uh, suffering, essentially, through irregular breathing and a very active mind. Um, how you mentioned that what uh, Boteco, Dr. Boteco was seeing was that, well, the question was, are people getting ill due to irregular breathing or vice versa? And the link to anxiety, and obviously anxiety is such a, a big issue right now, mental health, that uh, many people, in fact, culture is not taught how to breathe, we're not taught how to breathe correctly. There's, a, there's no education here. So from your, from your experience, in terms of the link between the breath and the psychology, how are you, how do you, and especially your latest book, Atomic Focus, I'm guessing that you're talking a lot about how the, the breath is directly influencing the mind. How do you see the link between breath and, and mind? If a person has poor sleep quality, and if they are breathing through their mouth during sleep, if they have snoring or obstructive sleep apnea as I had, they are not going to have a calmness of the mind. If a person has dysfunctional breathing patterns, if they're breathing that bit faster and harder, maybe using the upper chest with irregular breathing, they are not going to have calmness of the mind. In order to achieve calmness of the mind, we have to improve sleep and we have to improve functional breathing. I don't think meditation is going to do it. And this is not a critique because I've I'm a huge fan of Vipassana and I've done the 10 days of noble silence on a few occasions. And of course, when you're working with the breath, you're going to have some degree of focus on the breath, but it's not just enough to focus on the breath. We have to change our breathing patterns because meditation was developed two and a half thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. And life was different then. Life is very different now. And there is a chronic stress out there. And 75% of the anxiety population have dysfunctional breathing patterns. And these people are going to various healthcare professionals. And what's been overlooked is their dysfunctional breathing. So atomic focus was, my aim at atomic focus was to bring breathing and sleep quality to address two traits that we need so vital in today's modern society. And those traits are concentration, which is our ability to hold our attention to one thing, and attention span, which is the length of time that we hold our attention on that one thing. And then focus is narrowing our attention to doing one thing. And society demands that we can concentrate, but nobody teaches us how. I was in school 16 years in education, and for me to pass any grades academically, I was studying for 10 and 12 hours a day. And as I said in the introduction, I genuinely left school at 14 years of age, born out of frustration, because you're demanded to sit there for six or seven hours. And for a child or adult who has poor concentration, they're gonna find it a lot more difficult. And then society is grading them as being intelligent or not based on what they can achieve in exams without, the education system assessing whether these people can concentrate or not. It has been a huge failure in, in education. And I totally agree with what you said there. It's vitally important that education should be instilling a means that we can control our mind and that we have an insight into what's going into the, on the mind. But in terms of addressing that, we have to address the basic physiology because 
I've seen people coming in over the years, thousands of people, James. I remember 2010 to 2013, 3,000 people attended courses here because of anxiety and panic disorder. And I was giving small groups because Ireland was a mess economically and there was a lot of anxiety out there. 90% or even more, 95% of them were female. Male weren't, males weren't attending breathing. And then that's why the oxygen advantage was born because I wanted a high performance breathing technique that pushes people. And I'll just give you an example. I was working with elite snipers about four weeks ago, five weeks ago. And these are elite police personnel who are military tr trained. And their job is to look into the sight of a gun for one hour as they, as they assess the situation. And for that, it demands absolute attention and concentration. But then we spoke about what's the best way in terms of pulling a trigger. And I know this is not going to fly well with probably some of your audience. And I'm only using it as an example, because I think here is the power of the breath. We can alter states by changing our breathing patterns. And I was, I had never, I'd only shot a gun, a shotgun once before. So I had no idea about guns or anything like that. But I was trying to bring breathing into it. And I was thinking, do you breathe in and take the shot or do you breathe out and take the shot or do you breathe in and take the shot as you breathe in or do you breathe out and take the shot as you breathe out? When we look at the inhalation, it's sympathetically driven. The vagus nerve steps back and the exhalation is primarily under the control of the body's parasympathetic nervous system. So the best place to take the shot is at the bottom of the exhalation is to breathe into the shot. Because when you have a very soft breath coming into your nose and a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out through the nose, the vagus nerve is stimulated. And it's this nerve that's wandering throughout the human body. It secretes the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which causes a slowing of the heart. And when the heart rate slows down, the brain is interpreting that the body is safe. So it's very important that we can alter our states. And this, has the, this is the power of yoga. And it would be tremendous that if a person was going into a yoga studio with mouth breathing during the day, mouth breathing during sleep, mouth breathing during exercise, and if their breathing was a little bit faster and harder and they're feeling breathless, that the yoga instructor knows specifically what exercises to give to that person. It would transform lives because I have to say, if you have dysfunctional breathing, it's not a nice place to be. Your sleep is affected your mind is affected, your concentration is affected. You're not good at doing physical exercise because you're overly breathless. And many people will go to yoga because they don't like going to a gym. You know, they want to do something that's very powerful for their health, but they don't want to use the physical exercise that, you know, that people resort to. But breathlessness can hold people back. And the breathing of the person in the yoga studio is not is influenced by how they breathe outside of the studio. And it's very important to look at breathing, not just about taking that full deep breath, but improving the biochemistry of the breath. Like my example was when I started breathing less air and deliberately breathing less air to create a feeling of air hunger, my hands started to get warmer. And it's so common, you know, many of your listeners will, will kind of identify with this, that they have cold hands and cold feet. And they, they will have brain fog to some extent as well. And I never knew that you can improve your blood circulation at 70,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body. We can influence the circulation through the breath, but not by taking the full big breath, by taking subtle breathing. And I think this is coming back to original yoga. Because there was a two words you said there. One was constraint of the breath. Constraint. What does constraint mean? Does constraint mean that we take a slow, big, full breath? Or does constraint mean that we are holding back the breath? That we are breathing subtle? That we are breathing light? And you also stimulate the vagus nerve when you do that. And the vagus nerve, by stimulating it, there's two directions that we can help to bring a balance in the autonomic nervous system. And you spoke about balance as well, because as human beings, we need to be in balance in terms of the body's rest and digest response and the body's fight or flight response. 
and that implies resilience. It's a very good coping mechanism for stress. And, you know, you can see this in everyday life. Like we have people who um, work here alongside us and some people are naturally well able to stay calm and resourceful when there's a tricky situation. But other people, they fly off the handle. But when you look at the people who fly off the handle, their everyday breathing is off. And Dr. Rangan Chatterley, um, he has a podcast, I'm sure you're, you're probably familiar with him. He was interviewing a brain surgeon about four weeks ago or so. And the brain surgeon, I quote, because I included his quotation in the book, because when I heard it, I said, bingo, this guy has it. The brain surgeon says that when I get into a tricky situation, the first thing that I do is prevent myself from hyperventilating. And people think that I'm born of nerves of steel, but it's not. He understands that when he gets into a stressful situation, the one thing that's going to change is that our breathing is going to get faster and harder. And we can have control over the breath and especially in the exhalation. So just as the sniper taking a soft breath in through the nose and a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out, whenever we're feeling stressed throughout the day, Take that very soft breath in through your nose, completely silent, and have a very relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out. And what you're doing by doing that breath is you're telling the brain that everything is okay and the brain is going to calm. Because when we go into that, and I would have been that guy that was in that fight or flight, there was a situation, automatically my breathing would get faster and harder, as it does for many people. But what does the brain want to do in that situation? Whenever you're breathing faster and harder, the brain is thinking that the body is under threat. And all the brain wants to do is get the body to hell out of there, to protect the body. It's not, a, it's not a time for logical thinking or coming up with a good solution. Because to come up with a good solution, you need to have that calmness of the mind and you need to allow the idea to, to originate in between thoughts. So that's, you know, I think everyday tools that we all use. And it does come back to an education of the breath and understanding that it's not all about breathing deep, that there's three dimensions to the breath, that when you breathe less air, you improve the biochemistry of your breathing, which influences your blood circulation, which stimulates the vagus nerve, which increases oxygen delivery. Now, you know that you're stimulating the vagus nerve when you breathe less air, by virtue of the increased watery saliva in the mouth, because the body is preparing for the digestion of food. So whenever we have increased watery saliva in the mouth, we're going into that rest and digest response. Conversely, when we get stressed, the mouth goes dry. And then we bring in slow breathing and we purposely slow down the breath to a timing between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. And this in, help, this in turn is helping to strengthen the bar reflex which in turn then is improving heart rate variability, um, which will be a measurement of vagal tone, how reactive or how well is the vagus nerve working. So there's two ways that we can target the vagus nerve. One is directly by slowing down the breath, especially the exhalation and breathing light to stimulate the vagus nerve. And the other is by, by improving the sensitivity of the bar reflex. And then of course we breathe low or breathe deep. And the reason that probably the better word is to breathe low but I wanted to use an acronym, LSD, because I thought people might remember it that bit easier. But the one thing that I would say is that I don't think we can achieve optimal breathing using the diaphragm unless we breathe in and out through the nose. And I will always say to the students coming in, look down at the chest and take a breath through your mouth. And when you breathe through your mouth, you're engaging the upper chest and you're breathing faster. And what is that telling the brain that you're under threat? And Despite this, James, 25 to 50% of studied children persistently mouthbreathe, and nobody is telling these kids to breathe through their noses. And here is another opportunity for yoga. I have very little reach, but can you imagine if every yoga instructor, and it, I, I would say it is the best modality in the world for getting functional breathing out there and to go way beyond what has been happening to date for the yoga instructor to understand breathing in a depth that if somebody walks in, if I have somebody coming in here with panic disorder, 
I have specific exercises that I can teach this person. So from a psychological point of view, I will give them, now, by the way, I've made plenty of mistakes and I've put people into panic attacks. And I remember I was in London doing a class, God, it's going back maybe three or four years, much more, four or five years ago. And there was a young guy in there, he was 20 years of age, quite high anxiety, but he didn't attend for his anxiety and he attended for his asthma. So I was putting him through all the asthma exercises and that was at 10 o'clock in the morning. And he sent me a text at four o'clock that day. He was after admitting himself to accident and emergency. I'd put him into a panic attack, but that's the power of the breath. Now, of course, I didn't mean to. Um, and it was from making mistakes like that, that you learn and you get the experience that we have to tailor exercise according to the individual. So from a psychological point of view, we have people breathe less air and it's a controlled dose of suffocation, if I use that word. And it's training them to be able to surrender to the discomfort that their brain doesn't react. At the same time, we're improving blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain, which is a calming effect in the central nervous system. At the same time, we're stimulating the vagus nerve and improving the bar reflex sensitivity, which is bringing the autonomic nervous system back into balance and helping bodily, bodily systems that are disturbed by stress, helping them to recover. And then of course, we look at breathing with optimal movement of the diaphragm because of the connection between the diaphragm and the, and the brain. But we also look at sleep because I don't think we will ever achieve calmness of the mind unless we get that deep, deep sleep quality. So from a psychological point of view, we're looking at a number of different dimensions you know, surrender to suffocation, improve blood flow and oxygenation, strengthen the bar reflex, improve the autonomic nervous system, that balance, and also improve optimal movement of the diaphragm. But just before, because I'm probably talking too much, but in Stratford-upon-Avon, that famous town, there was a study carried out and it was published in the journal Pediatrics in 2012. And a researcher called Karen Bonnock she looked at 11,000 British children and she looked at whether these children had sleep disorder breathing at age five. And the children with sleep disorder breathing, which includes snoring and mouth breathing as a contributory factor. If these were, kids were untreated at age five, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. Now, the reason being is because deep sleep is so vitally important for the childhood development because their brain is developing during the deep sleep stages. But if the child is snoring or if they have sleep interruptions, they're not getting down into that deep sleep and it's causing brain damage. And that's not my words. And that's not just one study, Karen Bonnock's, but I include that one because it's a five year longitudinal study. And you'll, you'll find it, um, like I've written about it in several books because this information is not getting out there into the hands of the public. And I was totally frustrated for many years because I coming from a background of having asthma. And if you think of the people in asthma with the, in the UK with asthma, it's about 8% of the UK population, five or 6 million people. And people with asthma are, are tired. They don't just have asthma. They're tired and they're a little bit more anxious because of the breathing pattern disorder that's accompanying their asthma. But yet, Nobody wants to know about it. And that was unfortunate. So that's why I started writing books. I wanted to find out what was the best way to get this out into the hands of the general public. And somebody will spend 10 pounds on the book and they will do that. And that's why I brought out Atomic Focus. How do we bring it into the male population? And I wrote the book primarily to improve productivity to be more resilient in the workplace. And by doing that, we have to achieve a calmness of the mind because I don't think men are going to go into a bookstore and walk out with a book on anxiety. Maybe I'm wrong, but they will or are more likely to go into a bookstore and feel comfortable walking out with a book about atomic focus. But the very tools that we use to improve concentration and focus and attention span are the same tools that we use to bring a stillness to the mind, to quiet a racing mind, and to achieve gap 
between thoughts. Which is so important just for day-to-day -day living to be more centered, to be calm, to be creative. And you mentioned so many uh, significant points there, but one of the main ones is the nasal breathing. And I've just got the micropore tape here, which I know you encourage uh, students to cover the, the mouth when they sleep, which I've just started doing the last few weeks. It's been phenomenal. Um, covering your mouth with the tape so you are essentially forced to nasal breathe when you sleep and um, and that is going to instill nasal breathing not only into sleep so we're sleeping better we're having deeper uh, more restful sleep but also instilling that nasal breathing as it becomes a habit into day-to-day -day living during the day why is in terms of scientifically, I know we talk about nitrous oxide, the mouth is for eating, the nose is for breathing. Why is nasal breathing so important uh, for, for us? Well, what does the mouth do when it comes to the breath? Is there any function? If you were to, to stand in front of a mirror and open your mouth and look into your mouth and ask, is there any function by the mouth when it comes to breathing both in and out? And the answer is there is none, zero. And I don't think there is any medical textbook in the world that will say that the mouth imparts functions to the breath. The mouth is a hole. And it's a hole to allow air to go straight down your throat and it should be used in times of emergency. And that's how our ancestors would have viewed it. If we wake up in a dry mouth in the morning, we are more likely to wake up feeling fatigued. We have a greater increased risk of, of obstructive sleep apnea, which is relatively common, even though it's, it's overlooked. Snoring, uh, insomnia, lighter sleep. And I don't think any of us are going to have that quality of life if our sleep quality is not right. Now, we do have a different tape as well. We did use 3M Microport tape for many years, but it can scare the life out of people. And it was the only thing that was a bit off the wall of what we were doing. And then I had a problem because a lot of the kids coming in, they come in with their parents and I can't have kids wear tape in their mouth, but I do need the children to get to nose breathing. So I'll show you this tape if it's all right. This is an idea to get the mouth closed, but it's completely safe. It's my, my old tape. And it was developed primarily for the dental profession. And now the color has changed. We changed the color now because orange wasn't going down too well. So this is the, the tweaks that you make. But it's an elasticated cotton tape. And you get the tape and you stretch it by about 40%. And because it's stretchable, there's now an elastic tension. So it's bringing my lips together, but it's also stimulating the orbicular source muscle, which is surrounding the mouth. And if a person had to mouth breathe because of an emergency, they can. So I think it's important for people with anxiety um, because understandably they can be apprehensive about sealing their mouth closed. But I will say this, it is really vitally important. And none of this is new information. This has been known for hundreds of years that if we have the mouth open, there's a book that you will find online. And it was written by an American painter called George Catlin or George Catlin. He taught that the American traditions, the, the traditions of the, the North American Indian were dying out. So he went and he lived with them for a couple of years and he documented how they lived through his, his art. And he wrote a book probably 150 years ago called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. And he spoke about the Indian babies. Whenever they had the mouths open, the moms would come over and press their lips together to ensure nasal breathing. And he spoke about the European settlers with their mouths wide open, breathing hard and fast. So, you know, just a couple of points about nose breathing. When you breathe through your nose, it increases the pressure of oxygen in the blood by 10%. So that's pretty important. When you breathe through your nose, you're helping to protect the entire upper airways and the lower airways. When you breathe through your nose, you've got better engagement of the diaphragm. When you breathe through your nose, it slows down your breathing, both on the inhalation and on the exhalation. And slow exhalation is very important for a calmness of the mind. 
When you breathe through your nose, you pick up a gas called nitric oxide. And as you draw nitric oxide into your lungs, it's antiviral and it's antibacterial. And this play, can play a role in, for example, as a first line of defense against COVID to reduce viral load. And there was a paper that was published in Microbes and Infection in May of 2020. And the researchers spoke about sealing the mouth closed during sleep to give the immune system sufficient time to, to mount an effective response. And nitric oxide has been completely overlooked in COVID. And nose breathing has been completely overlooked. But also it's important to breathe out through the nose because when you breathe in air into the body, your nose warms that, coming, that air coming in, but it also moistens the incoming air. And now when you exhale, your nose recovers the heat and the moisture from the exhale breath. So there's a 42% greater water loss by breathing out through the mouth. Now, you might have to edit this because my battery is going down. I'm sorry. Um, I thought, can you just wait for a moment? Yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely. afraid I'm going to lose it. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Just take a note of the time there. Sorry about that. Don't worry, don't worry, no problem. Um, so yeah, so I think I've kind of covered the main points there of breathing through the nose versus the mouth. Excellent. And when you breathe through the nose, it allows the nasal airways to open. And as soon as you start breathing through the mouth, they tend to shut down. I've noticed that. I'll go, I'll have a perfect night's sleep, uh, which is always a blessing when that happens and you sleep straight through. And I've been fine. I've had the, the mouth sealed and then I'll take the, the tape off and then it might be a bit of breathing through the mouth. And next thing you know, I'm getting stuffy nose. Yeah. And is that again, due to the, the nitric oxide, it's allowing to opening the, the airways. Is, is, that, is that one of the other benefits? It, it may be. It's not fully known because you can also decongest the nose by holding your breath. But you're right in saying that the more you breathe through your nose, the better it works. And if you do switch from nose to mouth breathing, your nose will tend to get stuffy. So people can practice to decongest your nose. And this would come back into the breath holding, the pauses of the breath that would happen in yoga. So for example, to open up your nose, take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold your nose and just walk, walk around holding your breath. So walk holding your breath and walk until you feel a moderate to strong air hunger and then let go, but breathe in through your nose. And if you do that three or four times with a minute's rest in between each, your nose is starting to open up. Don't do it if you're pregnant um, or if you've got serious medical issues. So it's not fully known how the nose is working. Um, it could be that when you hold your breath, for example, it's activating a stress response, which is helping to open up the nose. It could be nitric oxide. I, nitric, nitric oxide was first discovered on the exhale breath of the human in 1991. So it's a fairly recent discovery and it's even taught to play a role in sleep. So this is another reason why we should be breathing through the nose during sleep because it's an aircrine messenger to the upper airway dilator muscles. And we had an article, I had an article that was published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in January of this year. I wrote it with two ear nose and throat doctors and it's looking at breathing and the phenotypes of sleep apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is much more prevalent when there is nasal congestion and the person is breathing in and out through the mouth. But unfortunately, it has been overlooked. And I would say that 50% of the adult population have their mouths open during sleep. It's not ideal. And I'll give you this example. I had a woman come in to me, I don't know, a few years ago. And she had depression and a long history of depression. And just in the course of conversation, I asked her, I said, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? And she says that when she gets up, she feels absolutely exhausted. 
And I said, has anybody ever investigated your sleep quality? And she said, no. Now you can imagine here's a woman that is going to, obviously she's attending the whole healthcare system here in Ireland, psychiatrists, doctors, whatever, whoever she's going to. And they've completely missed her sleep quality because they're probably suspecting that it's her depression which is causing the exhaustion. But maybe we should be questioning because she's exhausted because of poor sleep quality. And it's her exhaustion which is causing her to be anxious because she's not able to be productive. And it's the chronic anxiety which is contributing and causing depression. Absolutely. And sometimes we have to look at that loop. And there's another thing that I might as well bring it in because I can't, I, unless I forget about it, James. Breathing for female is different to breathing for men. And this has been known about since 1915. So women during the monthly cycle, post ovulation, mid luteal phase. So it's between, I think, days 10 and days 22. There's an increase in the hormone progesterone and estrogen, but progesterone is a respiratory stimulant and it causes the breathing of the female to become faster and harder. Their carbon dioxide levels can drop by as much as 25%. And this in turn is increasing pain perception. It's reducing pain thresholds. It's contributing to fatigue to anxiety and to panic. And what's more, the symptoms of PMS are directly attributable to increased sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Now, how many females are going through that and knowing that their breathing is changing, but not realizing that the connection is that it's the change to their breathing patterns as a result of changes in hormones, which is contributing to their symptoms. Georgie will tell you, um, you know, because she's been looking into this and I ignored this for 15 or 16 years until I was talking with a musician here in Ireland and his fiance was having quite, quite a lot of difficulty. And I knew I had come across it over the years, but not give it so much attention. And I just started digging a little bit deeper into it. It's phenomenally important, but again, overlooked. It's interesting what you're talking about when we mentioned the depression and I was watching an Andrew Huberman podcast mm. and he's talking about how one of the early signs stages of depression is uh, disturbed night sleep. And that's one of the, the first indicators of, of serious depression is that someone's just not able to sleep properly. And you can imagine yeah. if that night after night after night, you know, yeah. just, you're not able to sleep, that's going to affect your psychology as we've talked about. And I think, you know, the, fu the fundamentals, it's sleep and breath. And then, yes, you can add food and, you know, fluid and exercise. But sleep and breath are the cornerstones of good health. If you don't have those, it doesn't matter what you're eating or what exercise you're doing. You're really, really going to struggle. Yeah. And also, I love the uh, recognition, I guess, that, it, you know, in yoga, yoga is so widespread now nowadays. and. Yeah. Breathing is supposed to be a big part of, of yoga. Though when I uh, started to learn yoga, obviously we go straight into the pranayama and it's almost like that's the more advanced approach to breathing. Whereas the functional breathing, it is mentioned. We talk about diaphragmatic breathing and yogic breathing, but it's not stressed so much. It's straight into, you know, uh, ujjayi or bastrika or some of these more, um, like strenuous uh, breathing exercises. And, but really it's so in, important to bring in that functional, natural breath. And one of the first things I'll do, the first thing I'll do when I teach will be sitting and it'll be straight away, it'll be diaphragmatic breathing. And now I'm, I'm bringing in some more of the, the language that you use, I already talk about the slow breath and the, the deep low breath, the diaphragmatic breath with the abdomen moving in and out. And then you, you talk about the importance of the lower ribs expanding on contracting, but also the, the light breath as well, and just bringing in those three principles. And I find that if I'm teaching a class, I do that breathing not just for my students, because I know they may be anxious, they may be unsettled, ungrounded, they've just come in from work, but I do it for myself as well. It allows me to calm and to settle and become grounded so then I can teach and we're all on the same playing field. We've focused on the breath, the very first thing, slow, deep or low, and now introducing the light 
the principle into into the breathing and it's it's so important you can't again calming the mind becoming present and when we're doing yoga we're doing physical activity we don't want to be caught up in the mind we need to be present we need to be embodied it's so it's you know it's 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 a big part of, of yoga, the way that I like to teach yoga, be embodied, be in your body, because if we're in the body, we're not in the mind. And if we're in the mind, we're in the past, we're in the future, we're distracted, we're more likely to get injured, we're not going to get the same benefits from yoga. So we talked a little bit about um, the, the current situation, the current condition of yoga in the West. How do you, just to kind of conclude, how do you see the the situation now with yoga where there's on one hand it's such a great thing that so many people are practicing yoga and it's become so mainstream and it is help helping a lot of people a lot of many a lot of benefits but at the same time these basic fundamentals of breath are not really being taught or encouraged how do you see the current state of affairs with with yoga today western yoga modern yoga and in terms of the potential of, of what yoga can do for modern day uh, breathing? I think the biochemistry has been overlooked. I think assessing students' breathing patterns has been overlooked. Breathing hasn't been taken off the mat. It's not just how the person is breathing while they're on the mat. More importantly is how is the person breathing outside of the mat? The potential here is enormous. All those people who are attending yoga, and I can only imagine that if I was attending yoga back 25 years ago and going in as a chronic mouth breather, and for the yoga its teacher to tell me that, Patrick, you need to be breathing in and out through your nose, and I'll show you this pause here, and you can help open up your nose, and I'll show you now how to bring in light breathing with the poses that you feel our hunger, that you have to surrender to the air hunger. And by doing so, <clears throat> we reduce the chemo sensitivity of your body to carbon dioxide. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. It could be unbelievable. And I'm not saying like just that the breath is, is all and everything, but we can influence all of the major disciplines of medicine. And I just feel for the people maybe who are going in with asthma, going in with anxiety, going in with sleep issues, going in with different conditions, and the yoga instructor has the potential to completely transform these people through the breath. And I suppose I can understand also why it has been held back because of tradition. And breathing traditionally has been taught that way. And we need to also take breathing out of the woo-woo sphere, James. I don't talk about energy or anything like that. I talk directly about what I can do and what I can put the links there because, you know, for too long it's been ignored and something has held it back and i'm not sure what has held that back but if we're talking about airy fairy stuff and woo woo it's not going to happen we have to bring in the science and the science isn't perfect because we all know that the healthcare industry driven by you know dollar which pretty much is the is the is the truth is not going to be interested in breathing and it, this is really from the ground. This is going to be from the grassroots up. It really, really is. And I'm only thinking about the next generation of children coming up and teenagers. And, you know, a few years ago, we put out all of our exercise free for children, everything. And part of the reason being is because I struggled in school. So I have a personal modus operandi here. There are many children struggling in school. And these kids can be highly intelligent but they are held back because of a sleep disorder. And I, I don't expect their parents to know about it, but I would love that the healthcare professionals were a little bit more educated. And in comparison, yoga just has that reach because it's reaching out to millions of people and it will drive it from the grassroots. So I would say to yoga instructors, if you really want to see the power of breathing, learn more about it and understand it and practice it and understand what exercises are going to improve your blood flow. Because many people say, well, take this full big breath and you get more oxygen traveling throughout the body. Is that true? Because already with normal breathing, 
our blood is already almost fully saturated. So by taking full big breaths, are we going to increase the saturation of the blood? But what are we going to do? We're going to get rid of more carbon dioxide. And it's always just understanding what's actually happening. Like if somebody gives me a breathing exercise, you can break that breathing exercise down into what's, what's it doing to the body. And you think of experienced yoga instructors. They can have suspension of the breath. They could be breathing in the lightest of our breath for maybe eight or 16 seconds and holding the breath for maybe 32 seconds and exhaling or whatever, whatever the ratios are. But to achieve that, you have to have functional breathing. Now, you can assess a person's breathing patterns by using their breath hold time during wakefulness. So, for example, yoga instructor could be the yoga instructor has got everybody just come into class and everybody has settled down and there's a clock up in the wall and the yoga instructor is saying to everybody, what I would like you to do is to take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold your nose and time it in seconds. How long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the first involuntary movement of your breathing muscles? And then when you let go, your breathing should be normal. The yoga instructor will be able to assess pretty much straight away those people who are really having difficulties with their breathing. They are not going to be the experienced student. A yoga instructor and yogis from tradition, typically their breath hold time was as high as 180 seconds. 180 seconds. Now that is super power breathing. But if you were above 25 seconds, according to the BOLT score there, there's an 89% chance that you don't have dysfunctional breathing. But if you have a student who comes in and use, as you said, they're highly stressed, we would give them breath hold exercises to warm them up, to get them into it gently. And we would also give them feedback that if your breath hold time is say 10, 15, 17, 18, or 20 seconds, there's a lot of, there's room for improvement. Certainly a lot more room for improvement if your breath hold time is 10 seconds versus 20. And it, like it's, it's, I think it's simple stuff, but maybe it's not so simple, but it's, it's powerful. Starting to introduce breath holds into practice, into asana, and just to develop that uh, yeah. tolerance. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Ujjayi breath? Because when uh, Ashtangis, especially in Ashtanga yoga, they work with Ujjayi and it's a slight, I'm sure you're aware, a closing of the throat, of the glottis there. And when you inhale through the nose, it does make a sound. So it's not a, a silent breath, but because you are sl slightly closing the airways, you are prolonging the breath. And so it's um, very calming for the mind. It heats the breath. And again, in the Ashtanga tradition, it's the, the, the breath that's used and when I'm practicing, I'm, I like to work with Ujjayi because it just, it does prolong the breath and it, it feels like you can go deeper into the practice. Are you familiar with, with that style of, of breath and have you kind of, how does that kind of um, relate to some of the principles that you're talking about? Well, I suppose with any breath, if the person is practicing Ujjayi and if they feel air hunger, you know that it's targeting the biochemistry. But if they believe that they should be taking the full big breath while constraining the throat at the same time, they could be causing overbreathing. Is the breath targeting the biochemistry? You'll know that by virtue of the air hunger. Is it targeting the biomechanics? You will know that by virtue of the movement, whether the person is breathing low. And is it resonance frequency or influencing the bar reflex you'll know by the speed of the breath simple tool um i would encourage people to do usually with their with with air hunger because that way you know that they are not going to be hyperventilating and even stress or breathing exercise like we would have some breathing exercise that were we are hyperventilating and very rapid breathing you know but it's a stressor but we always make sure that if you stress the body and mind because it's good to give us a little bit of a stress and we do long breath holds, you know, some of the stuff that we do can be pretty tough. Um, but if you stress the body and mind, it's very important to recover. And there's times that a good stress, a good stress is beneficial, but you don't want that good stress becoming too much of a stress because it's, it's, down, it's a negative then. And it's tweaking this to everybody as well. You know, 
I'd always be careful with people coming in with panic disorder and just because they're so sensitive to air hunger, some of them are, that they've got an overly sensitive alarm towards the feeling of suffocation. We go very gentle to desensitize their body's reaction to it. And um, yeah, and I suppose sometimes just be careful with some people. It's brilliant, excellent. And I think, as you mentioned before, really, if we can get this into the schools, this is, it's, it's not just you know, mindfulness, the arguably yoga, but breathing, the basic stuff, just to allow emotional management, just, uh, just the basic fundamentals to health and to well-being. If this can be taught at an early age in the schools. This stuff should be taught in the schools. It's oh, it's foundational, no question, you know, fundamental. Whereas we're yeah. just, you know, geography and you know chemistry and things that arguably we're never going to use. Uh, yeah, you know, in the yeah, future. yeah, yeah. And so, I totally agree. Yeah, I think it's, uh, and we are seeing now yoga, and mindfulness getting into schools, and I think, I think it's just a matter of time before these things become uh, yeah. more popular. And uh, the work that you're doing is is absolutely phenomenal, Patrick. And I'm very grateful for joining me um, today on this podcast. And uh, what's the best way to get in contact with you or to to maybe go through some of your courses? What's the the, the best way to find out more? Um, I've got courses. We've got small courses for different conditions on butecoclinic.com. So people with panic disorder, anxiety, people with asthma, people with sleep issues and children's breathing. And they're fairly cheap. They're 50 US dollars for two hours. And I lead the, the people through it, small groups. And we've also instructor training in Buteco from butecoclinic.com. And uh, our other website is oxygenadvantage.com, which is kind of more performance breathing, but we're, we're kind of opening up that into the body, mind and sport arena. And um, there's different courses on that. And then there's books as well, like The Breathing Cure, The Oxygen Advantage, Atomic Focus. And yeah, so there's different tools people can use to get, get an insight into it. Brilliant. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for, for your time. And uh, yeah, it's been great to talk. Thanks so much, James.